Thank you for joining us tonight. We've been doing a Bible overview, and the last few weeks we've been in the Mosaic Law, understanding what it's all about. And I came up with an outline that we've been going through. I divided it into different sections. Uh, but tonight, the email that went out, uh, I added a section, and I thought we'd cover that at first. I call it God's Weird Laws. Just uh, verses that I pulled out that when you read it, you're thinking, uh, why in the world does God have that there? And, you know, at first when I came out with the outline, I really wasn't going to go into these things. But, you know, I thought it's probably good to have a, a lesson on this because... Uh, as believers, we understand that Romans 6.14, since we've trusted in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection as atonement for our sin, we are not under the law, we're under grace. And so since we're under grace, then we're not subject to the Mosaic law. And so when you read stuff like this, these what I call weird laws, then you know, we have a tendency to say, well, you know, that was just for Israel and for whatever reason, I don't know why, but for whatever reason, God came up with it. You know, you may ask me, what's the, what's the purpose of that, that law as we go through there? And I may say, you know, I honestly don't know. I have no idea what's going on there. <laughs> you know, uh, I don't understand all these laws either. But I wanted to go through them because I think these are the things that believers aren't going to bring them up. People in churchianity aren't going to bring them up. It's usually the atheist, the unbeliever, who's trying to discredit what you believe. Where you say, yeah, I follow the Bible, I believe it's all true. And they'll say, well, that's just a bunch of hocus pocus. I mean, why are you following that stuff? Look at these rules. And they go back to there and you're like, huh, I didn't know that was there. Because you know that you're not under the law, you're under grace. So you're not really paying attention to that stuff. If you read through it, you just sort of skim over it. I mean, you don't really analyze it in detail. So, um, so you, you know, you may be caught off guard by somebody. And it's usually, it's going to be the atheist, it's the unbeliever. It's not somebody in churchianity. I mean, people who are truly trying to serve the Lord aren't going to pull up these weird laws and try to throw you off. I mean, it's, then the people who bring it up, they're just trying to discredit God, discredit the Bible, and uh, get you to doubt God's Word. So that's why I thought, well, because people may bring this up, um, it's a good idea to at least cover some of these. So uh, get a little background, understand uh, where we are here. Galatians 3, Galatians chapter 3. Remember that we, so today, body of Christ, we are believers. So, we are under grace. Romans 6, 14. Under grace. Not under the law, under grace. Israel, though, with that Mosaic law, Mosaic law, Israel, at the time anyway, are unbelievers. And so we go to Galatians 3, 24 and 25, this is going to show why these things are here. Why we've got the Mosaic Law. And it, it's a good section of Scripture. I don't know, it's got to cover at least 20% of your Bible, I would think. I mean, Genesis through Deuteronomy are long books with a, long, a lot of chapters, a lot of verses, long verses. So it's, I think Genesis, if you look at the number of verses, I want to say the biggest, the largest book in your Bible is Psalms. I want to say Jeremiah is number two and Genesis is three and then Isaiah is four, I think. I know Isaiah has more chapters, but as far as verses, um, you got more verses in Genesis than you do in Isaiah. A lot of material there. You know, it's a big section of your Bible and it's also at the beginning. So uh, it's good to know, you know, why it's there, what's going on there. Galatians 3 verse 24. Galatians 3 24. Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. But after that faith has come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. So Israel, so, so today, body of Christ, we're believers. We've trusted in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection as atonement for our sin. So we're not under the law, we're under grace, because the law is there, the law is a schoolmaster. The law is a schoolmaster. It's to teach you, and... That's what a schoolmaster does. It's to teach you, teach you to be justified by faith. 
our pride gets in the way. Our pride gets in the way and says, just like with Israel in Exodus 19, all that the Lord has said we will do. So when we see a law, our flesh says, hey, that's something I can do. Now you're talking. And that's why a lot of times when you're, let's say you're under, you're in churchianity, you learn right division. You say, okay, great, I'm under grace. I'm not under the law. Then a lot of times the first question is, well, what do I do? And the answer is, well, you read Paul's epistles, you believe what it says, you apply the sound doctrine using the mind of Christ. And for a, if you've got a legalistic mindset, that's really not a good answer. Because you're saying, okay, but what specifically do I do? Because the thing is, the law is, is basically for children. Spiritually speaking, Israel is children because they are unbelievers. The law is for children, and so the law is black and white. You know, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not commit adultery. It's all written down for you, and you know if you believe if you follow it or not. But you know, grace, though, is for adults. The moment you believe the gospel, you are adopted as an adult son or daughter of God. You receive your inherit you have an inheritance, joint heir with Christ. And as adults, you're treated differently. You think of, let's say, you know, depending on what stage of life you're in, let's say you have kids. And when the kids were little, you treated them under the law. It is, you come home, you do your homework. I know you want to play video games or you want to play basketball or you want to play with your dolls or whatever it is. You can't do that. you got to do your homework. And then there may be some time for playtime after that. And then you say, we got to go to bed at 8 p.m. I don't want to go to bed at 8 p.m. There's a show I want to watch on TV. doesn't matter. You're under the law. You go to bed at 8 p.m. on a school night, and you, when you get home, you do your homework, or whatever the rules are. Right? You, so that's how you do with your kids then, is you've got those, it's black and white. You do this at this time of day, and you can't do this, and maybe you can do this, and the, you know, you've just got all these rules set up. But then the children grow up. They're adults. They're still your children, but you don't have the same thing. You're not calling up your adult child who has... You know, graduated from college, has an office job, let's say, office manager like me. Let's say for me, my, mom, my mom's not calling me up saying, you are going to bed at 8 o'clock tonight, aren't you? you got to go to bed at 8. She's not doing that. I'm still her child, but I'm not under law anymore. I'm under grace because I have the maturity in my mind to figure this stuff out for myself. So I can say, now, if I stay up all night um, till 1 or 2 in the morning and then go to bed, and then alarm clock goes off at 5.13 in the morning, then uh, I'm, I'm going to really have an awful day tomorrow because I'm not going to get any sleep. I'm not going to be in a good mood. And tomorrow is really important because I'm doing our, we're doing our year in close, so it's very important. I might make some mistakes, and that might not be good for me. So, again, my mom doesn't call me and say, you got to go to bed at a certain time because you know tomorrow is real important. You're doing your year in close. She doesn't do that. I've got the maturity enough to know I need to go to bed at a certain time, get a decent amount of sleep so my brain functions correctly so that I, because I got a lot of important things I got to do tomorrow and I, I got to be on top of that. So I have that. Again, I'm still going to do the responsible thing, but I don't have to be told. Under grace, you got gray areas. And you know, life is full of gray areas. And so when you get to the law here, you got to understand. Number one, the settings are different. Is that number one, we are the body of Christ. We're adults, spiritually speaking. So we're under grace. Now again, you notice with the example of going to bed, I'm still going to go to bed at a decent hour under grace as opposed to being a child when I had to go to bed at a decent hour. But the reason I did it as a child is because my mom told me I had to do it. And today I do it because I make the mature decision that I better go to bed and get enough sleep to be able to function tomorrow because it's a very important day at work. So it doesn't mean when you're under grace, we're not saying discount the law because that's one thing people will say is when you say you're under grace. Oh, well, that means it's a license to sin. So you're saying we can steal, kill. Okay, you say we don't have to, uh, we're not under Ten Commandments, so we can disobey all those. No, that's not what we're saying. What we're saying is you've got to 
spiritual maturity to figure this out for yourself. God doesn't have to take you by the hand and hold you and say, do this, don't do that. Do this at a certain time, don't do this. He doesn't have to do that. He says, here's the book. You're my, I've adopted you as my adult son or daughter. So read it. I've given you the mind of Christ to apply it. I've given you the Holy Ghost to give you the understanding. So you read my word. The Holy Ghost will teach it to you as you believe it. I've given you the mind of Christ to apply it. You just use that. You don't have to follow these words. So what do you do when you're not under the law, you're under grace? You read Paul's epistles. You follow those. Well, but I need black and white. No, you don't because you're not a child anymore. You're spiritually an adult. And in life, there are a lot of gray areas. And I can tell you, at work, the organizational chart, whatever organization you're with, the ones that get paid the most money are the ones who have to deal with a lot more of the gray areas. If all you do is file, you just follow the file system. Or if all you do is data entry, you just enter whatever is on that page and you enter it into the computer. All you do is scan documents. I mean, it's very easy to follow. It you know, may take time and it's important that you do that. But it doesn't take a lot of, you don't have to really strain your brain to figure out what you're doing here. And so, because those are easier tasks, they get paid less money. The ones who are really the high, you know, I wouldn't want finance director of the board going before the board, being interviewed on newspapers, television, every action that the finance director does is scrutinized. He gets a whole lot more money than I do, and I don't want that job. I don't want all that, you know, put me in the back of the room doing a spreadsheet at a computer and I'll do that brain work there, but all that politics stuff and having to deal with that, I don't want to do that. There's a lot of gray areas, you know, what's right in this situation? Well, it's kind of hard to decide, a lot of factors. They get more money. Why? Because it's harder. Being an adult is harder than being a child. Being under grace is harder than being under the law. Because I got it, I don't just have a list of rules to follow, I got... Paul's epistles to read. And then the Holy Ghost teaches it to me. And then trying to apply it to a situation, it, you know, it's not always black and white. A lot of gray areas. So under grace, it's a lot harder. And that's why people don't want that. They, they like the structure of legalism. I, you tell me, go to the church, pay tithes, be a member, uh, you know, get water baptized, take communion when we have it. You know, you tell me these rules, I follow it, I'm fine. Because then I don't have to think. I just do what you tell me to do. But if i got to read Paul's epistles, let the Holy Ghost teach it to me, and then when I know the verses, how do I apply the verses in a specific situation? It's not always easy to figure that stuff out. A lot of gray areas. So that's why a lot of people like the legalism and like to go under that. So I can't give you an answer what to do under grace. You read it and figure it out yourself. But Israel is in a completely different situation. They're unbelievers. They're the kids. They can't handle the grace decisions, the gray areas. Because spiritually speaking, they're dead in their trespasses and sins. How does a dead person handle those things? That's why God gives them the Mosaic Law. Hebrews 9.10 tells you that the Mosaic Law, the Mosaic Law is fleshly ordinances or carnal ordinances. God isn't dealing with spiritual matters in the, in the Mosaic Law. I mean, He is, but He's dealing with them in a fleshly way. And that's why we're going to go over these weird laws. And you think, why in the world does it do that? Well, the reason is because God's goal is to give them a law to teach them to be justified by faith, to teach them to trust in God, to realize... I can't follow all these rules. I can't do it perfectly. I'm going to trust in God to save me. And then Christ will live in me. And then I can have the, the love of God come through me. Jesus was asked by a lawyer, Teacher, what's the greatest commandment in the law? He says, Love the Lord thy God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. That's the greatest commandment. And the second is likened to this. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Upon these two laws, hang, upon these two things, hang all the law and the prophets. So the law, that if you love the Lord your God with everything you have, and you love your neighbor as yourself, 
then you will obey all of the law. Love is the fulfillment of the law, Romans 12, Romans 12 tells us. Love is the fulfillment of the law. But the only way I have love, God committed His love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So I have to believe the gospel. For, for me, today, it's trust in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection is atonement for my sin. When I believe that gospel, then I've got God's love committed toward me. When I have God's love inside me, then I can read God's word, believe what it says, and apply it. And so when I apply it, then it's not because I have to do it. You know, just like I had to go to bed at 8, I wanted to stay up, but my mom told me I got to go to bed at 8, so I got to do that. That's not what we're doing. Instead, you read it and say, well, you know, it's a good idea if I go to bed at a decent hour tonight because I got a lot to do in the morning. Again, it's not I have to, but it's just based upon the maturity of what I know is going on, I'm going to make that decision. And so if you're under, once you've received God's love when you believe the gospel, then you're going to use that spiritual maturity that you have to apply God's word to whatever situation it is, and then God's love comes through you to others, and that's how you fulfill the law. But if you try to obey this law yourself, you can't do it because you have a sin nature, in your flesh dwells no good thing. There is none good, no, not one. There is none righteous, no, not one. You can't do it. So when God brings up these weird laws that we're about to go over, He's not doing it with the intent that they are going to obey the law. It's not. He's, the, the intent is the law is to teach them not to obey the law, but it's to teach them that they can't obey the law. Romans 4.15 Romans 4.15 says the law worketh wrath. That's why you don't want to be under the law after you're saved. That's why when you learn the lesson of the law to be brought to Christ that you might be justified by faith, God says, I'm taking that law out of the way. You're under grace. Why? Because if I'm under that law, it works wrath. Galatians 2, Galatians 2.18 says, under the law, I am a transgressor. I am a transgressor. Galatians 2.18 says, If I build again the things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. Well, the things that I destroyed is the law because I learned the lesson of the law, so I'm not under it anymore. I'm under grace. So it doesn't say under the law. It says, If I build again the things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. But essentially, that's what it's saying. So if you're under legalism, the law is going to work wrath. Why? Because there's no good thing in your flesh. All you have is a sin nature. And the sin nature uses the law to say, hey, I can come up with creative, innovative ways to break the law now. The sin nature says, thank you, law, for giving me some good ideas on how I can do all the bad things that my sin nature wants me to do. So the result is the law worketh wrath. And after I'm saved, if I put myself under the law, I'm a transgressor. So the next verse, Galatians 2.19, I am dead to the law. It says, I through the law am dead to the law. Why? That I might live unto God. So when we're looking at these laws, a lot of times you scratch your head and you say, why did God say that? Well, God isn't doing like you would in terms of your kids saying, you need to go to bed at 8 so you can get a good amount of sleep for the next day. You, you, we need to get out of this mindset of God trying to help us out in the material realm with these laws. I mean, some of them do. But when we get to these weird laws, they don't make any sense in the material world. Where they make sense, though, is in the spiritual realm. God sets these weird laws to teach them to be justified by faith. The law isn't there for them to obey. The law is there for them to disobey, so they learn the lesson of the law that they can't obey it. They can't work their way into God's kingdom. They have to be justified by faith, so then they'll believe the gospel, and then they're removed from that law. Now, I mean, Israel is still under the Mosaic law because they don't get the atonement until Jesus' second coming. But as far as how God judges them, he will no longer judge an individual under that Mosaic law, by that law, if they've learned the lesson and they trusted in God to save them. You see that with David. David committed adultery and he committed murder. Both of those things in the Mosaic law says, kill that person for doing that. 
But God says, I'm not imputing those sins to his account. You say, what do you mean? He didn't do the, he didn't disobey these weird laws. He disobeyed the big ones, adultery and murder. And you're still not going to count him? No, because he's not under the law. He's under grace. In this world, yes, he's under the law. So he suffered the consequence. And uh, the consequence, he did get things happen in this life. He had the baby that was the result of the adultery was killed, was didn't survive, I should say. It didn't, wasn't killed, it just didn't survive. And uh, then he had a lot of trouble with his family and people trying to overtake his throne. That was the natural consequences of his sin that he, he received. But as far as spiritually concerned, God did not impute it to his account. Okay, so some of these weird laws. Uh, Exodus 23. I listed them in order that they come in your Bible. And I didn't give you all of them. I just gave some... And I thought, you know, we talk a little bit about these and try to tell you what I think, maybe why they're there. But in some cases, like, I have no idea. Uh, Exodus 23. Probably a lot of people know the fourth commandment of the Ten Commandments is remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. That's the seventh day. A lot of people probably don't realize that there's actually a Sabbath year. So we're law number one. Exodus 23, verses 10 through 11, is there is a Sabbath year. So just like you need to take the seventh day of the week and keep it holy, Exodus 23, verse 10 says, Six years thou shalt sow thy land, and shalt gather in the fruits thereof. But the seventh year thou shalt let it rest and lie still, that the poor thy people may eat, and what they leave the beast of the field shall eat. In like manner, thou shalt deal with thy vineyard and with thy olive yard. So, not only is there a Sabbath day of rest once a week, there's also a Sabbath year. Why? Well, it tells you it's to help out the poor people, and God's even taking care of the, the animals around there so that they can have food. But, of course, you know, the poor, they're not going to survive if they only get to eat one year and then they starve for six years. That's not going to work. So the main thing is what he's doing there is he's instilling the same principle uh, that uh, he did with the Sabbath day. It is for us today in the dispensation of grace, we are because our bodies are the temple of the living God, we are holy and beloved, then we don't have to have a Sabbath day dedicated to the Lord because every single day should be dedicated to the Lord. I should let Christ live in me, living by the faith of the Son of God all the time. Not just say, okay, one day a week on Saturday, it's Sabbath day, seventh day of the week, that's Saturday, so I'm going to serve the Lord that day, but the other six days I'll get drunk, I'll go out party, I'll do whatever I want to do. No, my body is a temple of the living God, and I've been bought with a price, and I should glorify God with my body, which belongs to God. 1 Corinthians 6 tells you that. So, um, we don't have the Sabbath day of rest because the rest for the Lord should be all the time. But Israel, remember, they're in unbelief. They haven't entered into God's rest because of their unbelief. So they're still under the curse of sin. So he gives them the Sabbath day once a week to demonstrate that. He's saying, you don't have to be holy all seven days. Just be holy one day out of seven. And of course, they can't do it. So again, that's the lesson. The law is a schoolmaster so that they may be justified by faith. If I can't keep holy one day out of seven, I mean, that's not much. That's 14% of my life. I can't be holy for 14% of my life. I certainly can't be holy for 100%. So I need God's righteousness imputed unto me by faith. And so the Sabbath year is there as well for that same illustration. That's the reason. And God isn't concerned about building up a great economy, having the highest gross domestic product, you know, and growing that so many percent a year. He didn't care about that stuff. He wants them to be saved and to come into the knowledge of the truth. So the law is there to teach them to be justified by faith. So that's why that Sabbath year is there. And in fact, they, Israel ends up being in the land for 490 years, and then they go into captivity for 70 years. Why? Because they failed to obey this law. So if you have if you're supposed to have a Sabbath year of rest once every seven years, in fact, God tells them that, that that's is exactly why it's 70 years of captivity. You're supposed to rest one year out of seven, and you're in the land 490 years, then that means you should have had 70 years of Sabbaths. 
and they didn't have any. They disobeyed this. So God says, okay, I'm going to give it rest because you didn't do it voluntarily. Now you do it involuntarily. You're out of the land for 70 years. So, uh, but, you know, if you're looking at it from a material standpoint, you say, well, that seems pretty weird. But, again, God isn't concerned with gross domestic product growing. He's concerned with them having eternal life by believing the gospel and then growing into the knowledge of the truth as they uh, read and believe God's word given to them. Uh, next one, Leviticus 19. Leviticus 19. There's a lot of good ones in Leviticus. Leviticus 19, verse 27. Leviticus 19, verse 27. And you know, while you're looking at this, one thing to keep in mind is, you know, people will look at this and they'll say, because a lot of people, they don't understand this purpose, that this is written to unbelievers and the law is a schoolmaster to teach them to be justified by faith. They're looking at it because they don't rightly divide the word of truth and they're saying, well, this is all for us. So then they're looking at it and they got to decide what to follow. So they'll look at this one, Leviticus 19, 27. You shall not round the corners of your head, neither shalt thou mar the corners of thy beard. You shall not make any cuttings in your flesh for the dead, nor print any marks upon you. I am the Lord. So you've got, uh, when I was growing up, and you go back, you know, back there 40 years and beyond, you know, back farther even, Leviticus 19.28 was the biblical uh, reasoning behind it being a sin to have a tattoo. Yeah, you can't have a tattoo. I mean, it says Leviticus 19.28, don't print any marks upon you. What about verse 27? I mean, it's just a verse before it. It says you can't round the corners of your heads, neither shalt thou mar the corners of thy beards. The way I see it is you can't, you can't round the corners of your head when you have a haircut. And you can't round the corners of your beard. You just got to keep it, you know, going. If you're going to have that beard, keep it going. Don't round it around there. Um, they never used that one. You never hear a church 50 years ago saying, well, the Bible says you can't have any tattoos, Leviticus 19.28. But then they, the same people that said that never read the verse before it and says, oh, what are you doing rounding the corners of your beard? God's prohibited that. It's because they, they'll look at it and they'll decide, well, this one I like, so let's enforce that one. But this other one I don't like, so let's throw that out. And that's really how churchianity does it. They look at the Mosaic Law and they look at it by piecemeal. In fact, they look at the whole Bible like that. Most of churchianity says we follow the red letters of Jesus. And they'll say, yes, Sermon on the Mount, Christian Constitution. You know, we're going to follow that. Well, what about over there in Luke 12 where he says, sell that ye have and give alms? Oh, he didn't really mean that. That means if you felt led. Well, I read at the end of Acts 2 and I read at the end of Acts 4 that they, everybody who had land and possession sold all that they had and laid it at the apostles' feet. It didn't say if they were led to or it's just certain people. All of them did that. See, they take, they take the Bible by piecemeal is the problem. So when they look at the Mosaic Law, they don't understand the big picture that we're under grace, so this isn't to us. And we're not saying, oh, well, you just don't obey it. Because you may say, okay, well, verses 27 and 28 are silly, so let's throw out Leviticus 19, right? We're not going to obey that. But wait a minute, look at verse, look at verse 18. Leviticus 19, 18, the end of that verse, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. That was when Jesus said, Upon these two things hang all the law and the prophets. It was love the Lord thy God, love thy neighbor as thyself. He was quoting Leviticus 19.18. Jesus didn't throw out Leviticus 19. He didn't say, well, around in the corners of your head, that's foolish, so let's just throw it out. No, he says, he said Leviticus 19.18 is incredibly important. He says that's the second greatest commandment in all of the law. And it's right pretty close to don't mar the corners of your beard. So you can't just throw it all out. The point is that all of this isn't here for you to follow because you're under grace. And it really wasn't going to be what Israel followed. It was there for them to learn that they can't do it so that they may be justified by faith. So what's the reasoning behind marring the corners of your, not marring the corners of your beard, corners of your heads? I don't know. I really don't have an answer to that one. So, uh, 
But, it, but the point is, if anybody brings this up as an atheist or an unbeliever and says, oh, you can't believe that God in the Bible. I mean, look at the crazy stuff that's in there. That's where you get the understanding. You tell them, well, that's not our rule book. Here's our rule book. You look at Romans 8, 2. Romans 8, 2 says, For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus, hath made me free from the law of sin and death. Law, sin, and death. So basically what that verse is telling you is that you've got two law books. If you are a believer, you're, under, you're not under the law, you're under grace. So what's your law book? Your law book is the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus. How does that happen? Jesus says, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. What are the words that Jesus spoke unto me? Paul's epistles. So what's my law book? Read Paul's epistles. Believe what it says. Apply it. And then when I do that, I'm living by the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus. But if I've never believed the gospel, I'm dead in my trespasses and sins. So if I'm dead, this is the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus. If my spirit is dead in trespasses and sins, then I can't live by life because I don't have life, I'm dead. So what I operate in, if I'm dead, is the law of sin and death. The law of sin and death is for children, that's that Mosaic law. So the purpose of that law, law worketh wrath, if I'm under the law, I'm a transgressor. So if you're under that Mosaic law, you're going to operate by the law of sin and death. And so God isn't giving you these weird laws so you can follow them. He's given them to you to show you you can't follow them. Even the simple ones. I mean, they're going to disobey this in their heart, in their rebellion, you know, even if they don't actually uh, mar the corners of the beard. But uh, that one, why? You can't, don't mar corners of beard or your head. I don't have an answer for that. But what the answer is, and someone brings it up, is we're not under death. We're under life, and so we operate by the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus. And we're not saying throw out all the Mosaic law, because, I mean, Leviticus 19.18 is a very important one. Love thy neighbor as thyself. But if I operate under grace, then I will love my neighbor as myself as a result of operating in grace. It's just we operate by the law book of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus. That doesn't mean that we automatically disobey the Mosaic law, and in fact... Paul teaches us that the only way that you do obey the law is by love. Love is the fulfilling of the law, and the only way you're going to have love is if you've received the gospel because God committed his love toward us, and then while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So the, if you want to obey the law, you can't be under the law because the law worketh wrath due to your sin nature. Okay, next one, um, Leviticus 21. This one here. I mean, if the liberals ever got a hold of this one and used this, I mean, they would, because, you know, today, you got the Americans with Disabilities Act, you got, you know, you got to make reasonable accommodations for everything, and you can't use some of these words that are in here. They're politically incorrect. You know, you got to make, and I'm not saying you disregard all, you know, the people that are physically, have physical ailments. I'm not saying that. But, you know, the, the culture of today is that we don't treat them any differently, that we try to help them out, that we don't give them negative, you know, have negative connotations to what we call them. But look at what God says, Leviticus 21, verse 17. Leviticus 21, 17. Speak unto Aaron, saying, Whosoever he be of thy seed in their generations that hath any blemish, let him not approach to offer the bread of his God. For whatsoever man he be that hath a blemish, he shall not approach a blind man or a lame or he that hath a flat nose or anything superfluous or a man that is broken footed or broken handed or crook backed or a dwarf or that hath a blemish in his eye or be scurvy or scab or hath his stones broken. No man that hath a blemish of the seed of Aaron the priest shall come nigh to offer the offerings of the Lord made by fire. He hath a blemish, he shall not come nigh to offer the bread of his God." So if you are a Levite, 
of that Leviticus 21, 16 through 22. Levites with physical blemishes basically can't do their jobs. They can't be priests. Not that they're not physically able. I mean, I'm sure, let's say, the dwarf, I mean, it's going to be harder for him because he's shorter, but he could still pick up bread. He could still do things. You know, it's just maybe harder on him or they, they're broken-footed or they're broken-handed. Again, it's going to be harder on him, but physically he could still do it. But God says, no ADA here, Americans with Disabilities Act, no reasonable accommodations here. God says, if you've got any blemish, and here's a list, if you've got any of that, you can't be a priest. You can't offer those things to God. You say, well, that's not fair. God's not just. He's not right. He's not fair. Well, yeah, I mean, it's not their fault. I mean, if you're born a dwarf, what are you going to do about that? God says, you can, you can worry all you want. You can't, Jesus said, you can worry all you want. You can't add an inch to your stature. You know, it's not the dwarf's fault that he's short. That's just how he's made. So now you say he can't be a priest? Yes. Well, that's unfair. Yes, but the problem is, you're not going to please God in your flesh anyway. And this is just a fleshly covenant. So what he's showing by this law, it's not that he's being mean to the people who have physical ailments. He's just trying to show, if you're going to approach God, you've got to be holy. That's the lesson of this. You've got to be holy. Holy to approach God. And you've got some kind of blemish. Therefore, you're not holy. Now, of course, that's fleshly. But spiritually speaking, all these people that have these ailments, if they recognize they're sinners and they trust in God to save them, they don't, spiritually speaking, they don't have any blemish. Jesus said in Ephesians 5, He's coming for a church without spot or wrinkle. No blemishes. Well, Colossians 3.12 says, We are holy and beloved. All of us here who believe the gospel have zero spiritual blemishes. We are all holy. Yes, we sin, but we're spiritually holy because of who we are in Christ. Christ has forgiven us all our sin. Christ has made us holy. So, it doesn't matter what your condition is physically. It matters what you are spiritually. And what God is showing us here is that since this is a fleshly covenant, then the people who administer the fleshly covenant, the priests, have to be without fleshly blemishes. And so, then they can't be priests. And it's a picture of spiritually speaking the only way you're going to have eternal life with God in His kingdom is if you are holy. And you say, just like the dwarf, he says, that's impossible for me to be a priest because I'll never be six feet tall. In fact, Jews, I think, back then were shorter. So, you know, a dwarf may have been like four feet. If you're five feet, you'd probably be normal height. Um, and you say, the four-foot dwarf, he'd say, I, I can never be five feet. I can never be a priest, and it's not my fault. Well, you just learned the lesson that you need to be justified by faith because guess what? You were born with a sin nature. Hey, you want to blame somebody? Blame Adam. I didn't do it. Adam did it. He gave me the sin nature. I got it from Adam. I'm kin to Adam. That's my problem. And I sin because I've got that sin nature. But God, through the death of burial and resurrection of His Son, Jesus Christ, took that away. So now I can be holy, spiritually speaking, and I can be part of that church, the body of Christ, without spot or wrinkle, not because of what I did, but because of what Christ did for me. And so this here is here to teach us that. You know, the liberals are going to look at it and say, oh, your God is a, you know, he's against uh, dwarfs. He's against, and we don't, you know, you don't even use the word dwarf. When I was growing up, the word dwarf was used. Now we don't use that. I don't know what they use now, but physically challenged or High, high, vertically challenged, or I don't know what they use. Uh, but the point is, uh, you know, they're afraid of just offending by in somebody with a word, you know. <laughs> um, God says, hey, you're a dwarf. You can't be a priest. But that's not fair. Well, you know what? What? Yeah, that isn't fair, but, but God's grace says, but you can be holy, spiritually speaking, and trust in me to give you that righteousness. So that's the point there. Uh, the next one, Leviticus 25. 
8 through 12. Leviticus 25, 8 through 12. So they have a, there is the Sabbath day of rest, one day out of the week, the seventh day of the week. Then every seventh year is the Sabbath year of rest. And then after you have a cycle of seven sevens, so after 49 years, then the 50th year is the Jubilee year. Is the 50th year, Jubilee year. Leviticus 25, verse 8. Thou shalt number seven Sabbaths of years unto thee, seven times seven years, and the space of the seven Sabbaths of years shall be unto thee forty and nine years. Then shalt thou cause the trumpet of the Jubilee to sound on the tenth day of the seventh month, and the day of atonement, shall you make the trumpet sound throughout all your land. And you shall hallow the fiftieth year, and proclaim liberty throughout all the land unto all the inhabitants thereof. It shall be a jubilee unto you, and ye shall return every man unto his possession, and ye shall return every man unto his family. A jubilee shall thou, that fiftieth year be unto you. Ye shall not sow, neither reap that which groweth of itself in it, nor gather the grapes in it of thy vine undressed, for it is the jubilee. It shall be holy unto you. Ye shall eat the increase thereof out of the field. In the year of the jubilee ye shall return every man unto his possession." If thou sell aught unto thy neighbor or buyest aught of thy neighbor's hand, ye shall not oppress one another. And it keeps going on from there. But basically, every 50th year, it's like what it is, it's a year of grace. It is, you don't have to work that year. You take a year off. You already get, God will cause the, the produce and animals and everything to, uh, to, to reap. You can sow. It says you don't have to uh, sow. You can just, uh, you can go ahead and, just eat of the increase thereof out of the field. You, and uh, if you owe debts, uh, a Jew owed another Jew a debt, it's forgiven. Land that you lost during that last 49 years, it goes back to you. Uh, and so they were to do that every 50th year. And what it does is it teaches grace. Because eternal life with God and His kingdom is not something that anybody earns. It's God and His grace saying, I give you that, you say, well, you know, it's Christ that did all the work. And so God institutes this jubilee year every 50th year to try to show you his grace. It's a picture of grace within the law. Okay, the next one, um, Numbers 15. Th this is a good one here to show you the... Uh, that this is a fleshly covenant. We actually talked about Numbers 15. I think it was Numbers 15. Um, before, yeah, the Sabbath breaker there, stoning the Sabbath breaker in verses 32 through 36. But then you go past that, Numbers 15, verse 38. Numbers 15, 38. Speak unto the children of Israel and bid them that they make them fringes in the borders of their garments throughout their generations and that they put upon the fringe of the borders a ribbon of blue, and it shall be unto you for a fringe, that ye may look upon it and remember all the commandments of the Lord and do them, and that ye seek not after your own heart and your own eyes, after which ye used to go a whoring, that ye may remember and do all my commandments and be holy unto your God. I am the Lord your God, which brought you out of the land of Egypt to be your God. I am the Lord your God. So Numbers fifteen thirty seven through... Through 41, yeah, number 37 through 41. Um, basically, uh, Israel or believers, I guess you could say, um, Israel should wear wear a blue ribbon. They all wear a blue ribbon. And what it is, and it tells you why, it's so that you remember. So in other words, if I'm wearing a blue ribbon, it shows that I'm serving the Lord. I think of these ribbons they have, like I think, uh, I don't remember all the colors, but you know, you can wear like a, like a red ribbon, might be like AIDS awareness, and yellow I think is cancer maybe, and I think pink is breast cancer, and they have these little ribbons that, just, that you can wear to support that. Well, here you wear a blue ribbon, and you, basically you show, I'm a law 
I'm following God's law. I'm going to follow God's law by wearing that blue ribbon. Uh, that right there tells you that this is a fleshly covenant. Because what does Paul tell us today over in uh, oh, 1 Timothy, I think it is, when he's talking about the, uh, the women there. Look in uh, 1 Timothy chapter 2. 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 9. 1 Timothy 2 and verse 9. So we compare this, compare this to 1 Timothy 2, 9 and 10. 1 Timothy 2, 9. In like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with broided hair or gold or pearls or costly array, but which becometh women professing godliness with good works. In other words, you adorn the doctrine is what he's saying. That's not really the verse I wanted. There's another verse that, that mentions that. Maybe a little earlier there. No, not earlier. Where it gives the instructions to, maybe over in Titus. Let's try, let's try Titus. Okay, that's not what I was looking for either. Let's go to 1 Peter 3. I know this isn't to us today, but it'll say it'll say this. And it's uh Paul says something similar, but uh, but I just can't find the reference offhand. Anyway, 1 Peter 3. 1 Peter 3, 3, 1 Peter 3, 3. Who's adorning? Let it not be that outward adorning of plating the hair and of wearing of gold or of putting on of apparel. But let it be the hidden man of the heart and that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit which is in the sight of God of great price. In other words, if you're under, if you're under grace and you have eternal life, Christ is living in you. It's telling the women, don't worry about what you look like on the outside, but instead have the ornament not of fancy gold, jewelry, makeup, fancy hairstyles, fancy clothes, but have the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit. In other words, you show on the outside what you're like on the inside is the point there. So the women are told to basically, women, and of course it applies for men as well, women adorn the doctrine. Because we're under a spiritual covenant, we're alive in Christ. So if you read God's Word, believe what it says, and use the mind of Christ and apply it, then what you're doing is you're adorning the doctrine. You're showing God's love coming through you to others so that they may be saved and come into the knowledge of the truth. So adorning the doctrine is a result of a spiritual covenant. But Israel, remember, they are unbelievers. They're dead in their trespasses and sins. They're not operating by the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus. They're operating under the law of sin and death. And so... If they adorn what's on the inside, that's not good. So actually, God doesn't tell them like he tells us and like he tells Israel, believe in Israel in 1 Peter, where he says to don't worry about what you look like on the outside. Make sure you have the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit adorn the doctrine in your life. That's what he says there. But for Israel, who's dead in trespasses and sins under that Mosaic law, he tells them wear a blue ribbon. He tells them, Put it on the outside. Why? Because it's a fleshly covenant with fleshly ordinances. And so the thing about that is, you know, you could th sort of think of this as just like, uh, I'm trying to think of, like, let's say you have a, uh, let's say you're driving down the road and you have a car, you're on your car, you got a big bumper sticker on the back. It says, I love Jesus, right? And you're driving down the road, I love Jesus is on the back of your car. But they see you, and they see you honking at the person in front of you. They see you flipping somebody off because of what they did. They see you rolling down the window and cursing out there. They see you, uh, all this anger and rage that's going on. Uh, what are you doing there? You're making Jesus look bad is what you're doing. Because you have on your bumper, you've got that bumper sticker, I love Jesus. 
And then people think, oh, well, that's a Christian. Let's see how a Christian acts. And then you're flipping people off and you're yelling and screaming and cursing. Uh, and you get all upset. And they'll say, well, that doesn't make Jesus look too good, does it? Maybe if you have an I Love Jesus bumper sticker on your car, maybe you're more likely not to be flipping people off, not to curse. And so what God says is, okay, what I'll do is I'll give you a I Love Jesus bumper sticker, except for you, that's not what it is. It's wear a blue ribbon. So everybody in Israel wear a blue ribbon on your, on your clothes. And what that shows is that you are following God. You're following that law. But guess what's going to happen? You are going to break the law. Why? Because you have a sin nature and, you, and you're dead in your trespasses and sins. So you're going to break the law. So if you're showing on the outside by wearing the blue ribbon that you reverence God, that you fear Him, that you're trying to keep the law, but yet in reality you're not keeping the law, then that's going to be a reminder to you. It's like if I have that I love Jesus bumper sticker and I'm flipping people off and I'm cursing left and right, that's going to make me think, you know, I'm not really... Do I really love Jesus based on my behavior? I don't think I do. So you wear the blue ribbon. I'm following the Mosaic law. I'm serving Jehovah God. But then you don't. So that's to show you, oh, I need to be justified by faith. I need to trust in God to save me. I can't do it myself. So it's just, it's interesting how it's a fleshly covenant. So God gives them a fleshly thing to wear. For us, we're not under the law, we're under grace. It's spiritual. He says, don't worry about spending a whole bunch of money on clothes and jewelry and makeup and all this stuff. Don't worry about the Botox and the facelift and spending all your life savings on this stuff. He says, adorn the doctrine. That's what's important. So we have spiritual indications. Israel has fleshly indications because they're under a fleshly covenant. We're under a spiritual covenant. So people look at that and say, well, that's kind of stupid. I mean, wearing a blue ribbon, what does that do? But uh, when you understand it's to teach you to be justified by faith, then it makes a little more sense. The next one, Deuteronomy 14. Deuteronomy 14, and I'm going to go back up here. Deuteronomy chapter 14. Verse 21, Deuteronomy 14, 21, Deuteronomy 14, 21, You shall not eat of anything that dieth of itself. Thou shalt give it unto the stranger that is in thy gates, that he may eat it, or thou mayest sell it unto an alien. For thou art a holy people unto the Lord thy God. Okay, so that, you know, that sort of makes sense. You know, if it's dying by itself... If you're holy unto the Lord, then you want to help out the stranger or the alien. And so you're, you're set apart because you've got clean versus unclean animals. And so you show that you're holy there. Uh, but then the last part, thou shalt not see the kid in his mother's milk. So it's saying don't boil a kid goat in his mother's milk. What in the world does that mean? Why Why can't you see a kid goat in his mother's milk? I mean, are you looking out for the kid goat? Well, obviously not. If you're boiling it, you're killing it. So you must not care too much about the goat if you're killing it. So what difference does it make if it's in his mother's milk or not? I don't know. Maybe it has something to do with the father and the mother. You know, the, if the, this children shall not bear the sins of the father and the mother. Each person bears their own sins. I don't know. That sort of makes sense maybe, but I, you know, that's one of those things that I don't really have an answer for. But somehow, you know, God, and, and I think some of these things, they're, you know, God, another thing is Isaiah 55 says, God's ways and his thoughts are higher than our ways and thoughts. Uh, so a lot of times we can't even understand what God's doing. So when you look at God, God designs a fleshly covenant to get Israel to recognize their sin and trust in God to save them. And somehow this law plays into that. How it does, I don't know. God's a lot smarter than me, so I, I don't know how, why. But uh, yeah, that's one of those things that uh, I don't know. 
But if you look in Deuteronomy 22, here's another one sort of related to that. Deuteronomy 22, 6 and 7. Deuteronomy 22, 6 and 7. Deuteronomy chapter 22, verse 6. If a bird's nest chance to be before thee in the way in any tree or on the ground, whether they be young ones or eggs, and the dam sitting upon the young or upon the eggs, thou shalt not take the dam with the young, but thou shalt in any wise let the dam go and take the young to thee, that it may be well with thee, and that thou, thou mayest prolong thy days. So, basically, take mother's eggs and let mom go. And, and he says, you know, this is pretty serious. I mean, he says, if you want it to be well, if, well with thee, if you want to prolong your days in the land, then that's what you're going to do. Uh, again, I don't know why that is. I mean, you would think mom would be grieved over losing her eggs. You know, she's been sitting on those. It says she's been sitting on them. She'd been sitting on them, taking care of them. And now you're going to steal her eggs? You know, if you, if you look in the animal kingdom, birds, animals, whatever, uh, usually animals won't do anything to you. You know, some of them are aggressive, but most of them, they'll run away from you. But if you try to mess with their babies, the, the mothers, oh, mothers get upset with you and do whatever they can against you. They're protecting them. And here you are, shooing away the mother, stealing the eggs, and leaving her childless, basically. I mean, that seems pretty cruel, and God says to do it to prolong your days. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe it's a type of the fact that God um, has Israel and Israel has forsaken him. I, I don't know, maybe it's a type of that to show that, uh, that God, God says Israel is my firstborn, but yet I'm separated from Israel due to Israel's sins. And so the fact that the eggs are separated from the mother is a type of that. And you can see the anguish in the mother to see the anguish that I go through. I don't know, I'm making that up. I don't know if that's the real reason. But you can see it's a pretty weird law. You gotta admit, this is pretty weird. And the next verse is a weird one too. Verse 8, when thou buildest a new house, then thou shalt make a battlement for thy roof, that thou bring not, thy, bring not blood upon thy house, if any man fall from thence. So I guess if you got a flat roof, you got to have a, a railing, I guess a railing around the flat roof, around the flat roof, because someone could just be walking on your roof and uh, fall off of it. And so then you're guilty for the person dying. So you've got to build a battlement or a railing around that flat roof. And again, why is these laws here? What, what does this have to do with, you know, it's, it's, it's in the Bible. I mean, you can look at the U.S. I'm sure you can go back and find some code, law code in some city or some state. You can probably find some website that'll find laws that have been on the books for over 100 years that make absolutely no sense. Um, but you know, God is wise. He's the only wise God. It's not like he just made this up out of thin air. There's got to be some purpose for it, why he told them this. Um, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what the answer is. Uh, Deuteronomy 20. Deuteronomy 20. Verse 19. Deuteronomy 20. Verses 19 and 20. Deuteronomy 20, verse 19. When thou shalt besiege a city a long time and making war against it to take it, thou shalt not destroy the trees thereof by forcing an axe against them, for thou mayest eat of them, and thou shalt not cut them down, for the tree of the field is man's life to employ them in the siege. Only the trees which thou knowest that they be not trees for meat, thou shalt destroy and cut them down, and thou shalt build bulwarks against the city that maketh war with thee until it be subdued. So basically, don't cut down fruit trees in war. Don't cut down fruit trees in war. And it seems like the reason is because it says the tree of the field is man's life. So it's like, well, if I cut down the fruit tree, then the city that I'm besieging and I'm at war against 
the people of the city can't eat uh, from the tree. So it's like you're looking out for the people that are in the city so that they have food to eat. But if you're besieging the city and God says to utterly destroy the people, which he tells them to do when they get to Canaan, then if you're going to kill them anyway, why do you make sure that they have fruit? Is it that God, you can go ahead and kill them, but he doesn't want them to starve to death? Is that the reason? Uh, I don't know. Maybe it's to show that God has compassion in, uh, in spite of the fact that we, uh, that man's kind's history is to be sinners and to, be, uh, to not believe in God and follow him and not believe the gospel. Uh, the Bible says the rain falls on the good and the bad. You know, God, get, now granted there are some famines and times where God does that, but I mean, look at, look at the world the way it is today and how evil and wicked it is, and yet it still keeps going. God still has the sun come up every day. He still has rain to fall down, and people can still survive, in fact, in spite of the fact that they blaspheme and curse him. So maybe that's God having compassion on them before uh, they're judged uh, into hell because of their unbelief. And I, I don't know. I don't know. It's just, uh, it's just another one of those weird rules in there. And, uh, and then, uh, let's see. And then the final one I had was Deuteronomy 22, uh, verse 11. And I've mentioned this one before, so probably, you know, this is Deuteronomy 22, verse 11 says, Thou shalt not wear a garment of diverse sorts as of woolen and linen together. So don't wear a mixed fibers shirt. So you can wear a 100% cotton shirt, but don't wear one that's 90% cotton and 10% polyester. And in fact, uh, I think they still have them. There aren't too many Orthodox Jews left, but the Orthodox Jews... They'll use that verse, and they've actually got people, and I forget what they're called, but they have people in the Jewish religion. If you're an Orthodox Jew, you can ask for a guy like this, and he will come to your house, and he has a way of examining all your clothes to see if you've got any fibers in there that are, that are not supposed to be there. You say, well, wait a minute here. I've got a tag on there, and it says this is 100% cotton. Well, that's what the tag says, but that was manufactured in some plant. Uh, you don't know. So this guy comes out and he actually examines the shirt or whatever it is and he'll say, oh, well, there's, it's 0.5% polyester. Throw it out. I mean, you got people doing that today. Again, Orthodox Jews are, are few and far between now, I think, but there are actually people in the Jewish religion who do that uh, still today. Well, why does he do that? I think this is all about holiness. So why would you throw out a shirt that's 99.5% cotton and 0.5% polyester? I mean, what's wrong with the shirt? Or even if it's 50-50. I mean, it's still, if it still fits you and uh, you know, it provides the purpose of keeping you warm and it fits you or it uh, you know, meets the dress code at work or whatever it is, it fulfills the purpose. Who cares what, that it's not 100% of one, of one fiber? Well, the reason is, is to show you it's holiness is the idea. You appear before God, if you're 99.5% righteous, that's not going to cut it. You have 0.5% sin, then you aren't really righteous. You're not holy. Just, just one sin. James says in James chapter 2, verse 10, that uh, if you break the law at one point, you're guilty of it all. The best law keeper that's ever lived except for Jesus, of course. Uh, he did it perfectly. But everybody else, even the best law keepers, uh, the 100 billion people that have ever, ever lived, they all have broken the law from time to time. And so they can't, have, they can't have righteousness. They haven't earned it. They can't have eternal life based upon their good deeds because they don't have any. They've sinned in some point. And so that's the idea here, is that if someone stands before God and he's just got a little sin in him, that's not good enough. He can't enter in. That's why all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The glory of God is 100% sinless perfection because God is holy, so you got to be holy. So the shirt has to match what you are spiritually. That's the lesson there. And I would say, 
on all these answers, really, when you boil right down to all these weird laws, some of these I had an answer for it. I think the one on the, the mixed fibers is probably the correct answer. Same thing when it comes to clean and unclean animals. You read Leviticus 11. Uh, why is it that uh, Israel could eat uh, a hamburger, they could have ground beef, they could eat ground beef, that's clean animal, but they can't have a strip of bacon because a pig is unclean. You know, how would you, how'd you figure that out? What's the difference between the pig and the cow as far as clean and unclean? Um, I don't know how God determined that stuff, but I can tell you the reason he did that is because you have to be holy. You have to be separate. There are things that are bad, things that are good. And you got to do the good 100% of the time in order to earn your righteousness. And you can't be like that. So you're going to be unclean, spiritually speaking, until you believe the gospel and God gives you his righteousness. So all of these laws, even the weird ones that I really didn't have an explanation for, like which ones did I not figure out? The round haircut, the, uh, the seething a kid goat in its mother's milk, and destroying fruit trees in the battle. Um, can't do that. Separating a bird's mother from her babies. The, uh, making a battlement around your roof. Those, I, I had guesses, and I don't really know if they're right or not. Um, but the bottom line is all of these things are here to show them to be holy. That you've got to have, if you're going to stand, because what they did, the premise, before God gave the law, look over there in Exodus 19. Look at Exodus 19. When God... When Israel had been in unbelief, they didn't trust in him. They kept murmuring and complaining. They've six times they've tempted God at this point. They haven't believed him. Uh, and so then God says, well, I'll give, you, I'll give you a law. And if you obey this law perfectly, then you will be holy before me. He, he, says, uh, he says in Exodus 19, 5 and 6, if ye will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine. And ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. So God says, I'll make a deal with you. Keep my commandments. You will be holy and priest. You will be my people. You'll have eternal life in my kingdom on earth. All you have to do is keep all those commandments. And so then in verse 8, the people responded, and it says, All that the Lord has spoken, we will do. All the Lord has spoken, we will do. Oh, really? So God says, okay, I'm going to speak some things. Let's see if you'll do them. So these weird laws are in there. And, uh, of course, all these other laws, next time we'll get into, we've already covered the tabernacles, the priests. We've covered the laws, the animals. Next time we can get into the social laws, criminal laws, and the rules with God. Um, we'll start going through that. But the whole purpose of this is God says, do everything I tell you to do. You'll be holy, you'll be a kingdom of priests, you'll have life, you'll be above everybody else. You'll reconcile the earth back to myself. All the nations, those Gentile nations that I gave up at the Tower of Babel due to their rebellion against me, they're going to be, come, they'll come back to me, be reconciled back to me, they'll have life in the kingdom, as, and you are going to be the ones that are leading that. You, because you kept all those commandments, then you'll be that kingdom of priests, and you'll reconcile the earth back to myself. I'll save you, Israel, and then you'll go out to the Gentiles and they'll be saved. And they say, all that the Lord has spoken, we will do. The problem is, they gave the wrong answer. Because the problem is, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. No one can obey these things. And in fact, if you look at the wording carefully, verse 5, he doesn't actually, I put down here, keep my commandments, he says, keep my covenant. But you know what he really does? He says, he says, he says, obey my voice. He says, if you will obey my voice, indeed. 
Well, who's the voice? John 1, 1, who's the voice? That's Jesus. John 1, 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Jesus is the Word. He's the voice of God. You go to Genesis chapter 3, because Genesis chapter 3, I see your hand, David. I'll, uh, I, I'm about to wrap it up, and I'll, I'll get to you there. In Genesis chapter 3, and verse 8, when Adam and Eve had sinned, and they sewed fig leaves together in Genesis 3, verse 7, then in Genesis 3, 8, here comes God. But the wording of this is really weird. He says, They heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. The voice of God walked. Isn't that interesting? I don't know about you. I've never seen my voice walk. My legs walk, my feet, my body walks, but my voice, it speaks, it maybe goes out toward people. Maybe if you have a microphone and go out farther, but it doesn't really walk. How can a voice walk? Well, because the voice is the Word. It's the Lord Jesus Christ. If the voice of God walked, this means it's Jesus. So when it says, obey my voice indeed, it's really Jesus who does that. And if you go to Romans 10, this is an important thing to understand because you'll see God mentioning about obeying and keeping my commandments and doing these things. And a lot of times when we see the word obey, we automatically think of our flesh. But God is a spirit. Those who worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. The way we please God is by Christ living in us. It's not our flesh, but it's what Christ has done for us, forgiving us of our sins, and then uh, living in us, and living by the faith of the Son of God. Look in Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10 and verse 16. Romans 10 verse 16 says, but they have, this is talking about Israel, and they had the opportunity to believe and be saved, but they didn't. And so it says, for they have not all obeyed the gospel, for Isaiah saith, Isaiah saith, quoting Isaiah 53, 1, Lord, who hath believed our report. So in that verse, obedience equals believe. So with those verses in mind, when God tells Israel in Exodus 19 and verse 5, if you will obey my voice indeed, obey means believe. Okay, obey means believe. And the voice is Jesus. He's the Word. The voice of God walked. So basically the way they, how are they going to do it? How are they going to obey ultimately? I mean, we know that when they said all that the Lord has said we will do, they're going to fail in that, okay? We know that. But ultimately, they are going to be a kingdom of priests to the Gentiles in the millennial reign. And then God is going to reconcile the, the world back to himself, the nations back to himself through Israel. So, I mean, God is going to keep this covenant of verses 5 and 6. This will happen in the millennial reign. But how do they obey the voice indeed? John 3, 16. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Believe in Jesus. That was John 3.16, by the way, is to Israel. I know people use it in churches all the time, but Paul's epistles are written to us. John 3.16 says, believe in Jesus. Exodus 19, verse 5, obey my voice. That's saying the same thing. You can make Exodus 19.5 a cross-reference to John 3.16. Because obey, according to Romans 10, 16, is to believe. They have not all obeyed, for Isaiah saith, 
Lord who hath believed our report. So obedience equals belief. Spiritually speaking, that's what it is. Get out of the fleshly, physical mind. The spiritual mind is the way you obey, my voice indeed is you believe. My voice is Jesus. So you believe in Jesus. Obey my voice equals believe in Jesus. John 3, 16. Whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Now, their gospel was repent and be baptized. So the believe in Jesus basically means believe the message. Believe the message of Jesus, which is believe the gospel. I mean, even James says, uh, you say there is a God, he doeth well. The devils also believe and tremble. So just because you believe Jesus existed doesn't mean you're going to be saved. Believe, John 3.16, when it says, um, Whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. It means that you trust in the message that Jesus gave, which is repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. You believe the gospel for them. For them it's repent and be water baptized. Uh, so that is how they're going to obey God's voice. So Exodus 19, 5 and 6 is answered by John 3, 16. By them believing the gospel, and that's how they obey the voice. But the problem is, they're stuck in Exodus 19, 8, and they said, all that the Lord has spoken, we will do. The answer, what they should say, and what ultimately saves them, is they say, all that the Lord has spoken, the Lord will do. <laughs> Because Jesus is Lord, and he's the one that fulfills all this for them. So then they just believe the gospel for them, repent and be baptized um, for the remission of sins. And so, basically, that's what all of this is about. So you get the atheist or the unbeliever, and they'll bring up all these weird laws, and I did have some explanations, but even if you don't have an explanation for it, the bottom line is the reason these things are here is as a schoolmaster to teach them to be justified by faith, that they may be brought unto Christ. Because um, I would guess that God could come up with a whole bunch of other laws that they should do as well. I'm guessing that what God gave them isn't every single thing that they should do as a nation in order to be holy before God. He just gave them a pretty good list and says, why don't you do these? And of course, because you said you'll do it, and then they learn, the point is, they learn, oh, I can't do all this, it's too complicated, it's too much work. How am I going to remember all this stuff? How am I going to do it? And even if I try, my sin nature is going to work with me to where I sin even more. And so then the answer is, it's not all that the Lord has spoken we will do, all that the Lord has spoken the Lord will do. I obey His voice by believing in Jesus, the gospel that He preaches, the gospel that I'm given by God in order to save me. Let's close with a word of prayer and then I'll get to your question, David. Uh, dear Lord, we thank you for the grace that you've extended toward us by sending your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to die for our sins and be buried and rise from the dead. Help us, Lord, not to get mired in legalism like Israel was back here, but to just recognize that you have us under a different law book, the law of grace, the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus. Help us, Lord, to read and believe Paul's epistles, let the Holy Ghost teach them to us so that Christ may live in us. God's love will be shown to others and your will be done through us, bringing you great glory. We thank you in Jesus' name, amen. Okay, David, uh, should be able to, yeah, go ahead with your question. Yeah, uh, in the Exodus uh, 19, 5, uh, I, it was, it's interesting how you emphasize the word covenant. And I, was going to, I, was going to, I just was going to say that they're not going to be able to do that until they have the new covenant. You answered it about five times since I've asked to <laughs> make the question. But uh, it's so interesting that he used that word covenant because he knew they were not going to be able to do that until they got into their kingdom and, had, and were under the new covenant. Then they were going to be able to keep those laws, even though they, you know, they thought they could. But... Yeah, so I just want to make that point. That's all. Yeah, yeah, that's very good. If you go to Ezekiel 36, and it talks about that new covenant they're under. And that's why, because, yeah, under the flesh, with the sin nature, you can't keep it. They couldn't. Wow. We can't. Nobody can. But Exodus 36, when he says they're under that new covenant, he says, verse 25, I'm sorry, I said Exodus, Ezekiel. Ezekiel 36. I got Exodus on the brain. 
Yeah, so the new covenant. So Ezekiel 36, 25, he says, Then will I sprinkle clean water upon you, and you shall be clean from all your filthiness, and from all your idols will I cleanse you. Verse 26, A new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you, and I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh, and I will put my spirit within you, and cause you to walk in my statutes, and ye shall keep my judgments and do them. So yeah, this is, I said, all that the Lord has spoken we will do. That's old covenant. New covenant is all that the Lord has spoken the Lord will do. How? His spirit is put within Israel, and that heart, that old heart of that sin nature is gone, and they got a new heart, uh, crying, Abba, Father, we want to please the Lord. So they cry, Abba, Father, and they got the Spirit of Christ within them, and then they will obey it. So yeah, new covenant is the answer, where they will, will, they will obey God. Yeah, so, yeah, it's good. Keep my covenant. You can't do it. Okay, I'll keep it for you. So, thanks, David. Thanks for that point, yeah. All right, well, have a good night, everybody. I'll see you tomorrow night. Thank you, Eric. And Eric, that on. That's good.